the ministry unless people are here supporting us in prayer and making sacrifices to see us on our way. We are very honored that you have chosen to be part of our support team. And so as we bring in this report to you, we want you to understand that this is a result of your investment in us. Everything that we talk about is because you have equipped us to be able to go out. And so we report as your representatives in the ministry God has given us. Am I, am I standing in it? Okay. Now, if at any time you have a question that comes up, feel free to raise your hand and, and stop me. Um, because I want this to be interactive, and so if you have a question that comes up, just raise your hand and ask me about it, okay? Um, we are actually celebrating 20 years in ministry, and, and that is a, a great celebration. Um, as we think back on that, we started in Greece, and God had given us the ministry to work at the Greek Bible Institute. And he allowed us to have an impact with many students there, many of whom we still have contact with through social media and other avenues. And God continues to grow them in their ministry as well. We mentioned yesterday morning one example of a, of a young lady that we encountered in Athens, uh, Sahar. She was very angry because God had taken everything from her in her home country of Iran because she was captured with a New Testament in her purse. But now, because Jesus got a hold of her life, she is now a, a minister to the refugees in Athens and continues to share the gospel with those refugees so that we're seeing a, a, a untold generations of Muslims in Athens coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. After we had been in Athens for a couple of years, God moved us on to Germany, where we now live and minister with a ministry called EDOT, uh, Debbie is showing you where we serve in the, the southwest corner of Germany. We live in a wonderful place where France, Switzerland, and Germany all come together. So sometimes we have breakfast in Germany, lunch in, Fran in Switzerland, and dinner in France. Uh. About 20 minutes from both of those countries. And you can see some of the, the beautiful scenes that are common to our everyday experience. We really are suffering for Jesus. <laughs> How many are you coming to visit? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so this is this this is where God has placed us to serve. These are the people among whom we serve. Um, again, you can see some pictures of our town. Uh, we we live in, a, in an area that is very picturesque. Uh, it also has a lot of rich cultural religion history. Uh, the, the church that you see down here is a Lutheran church. Uh, as I understand it, the previous pastor ran away with the secretary, and now there's a woman in, in the pastorship of that church. Um, it is open three times a year, Easter, Christmas, and All Saints Day. Uh, and the only time it gets used is for weddings or funerals. Uh, I, I kid you not. Uh, it, it, most of the time it stands empty. You would never see this many people in that church building. Germans would say that they're either Catholic or Lutheran. That means nothing to them other than them saying, I'm German. I'm German, I'm Catholic. I'm German, I'm Lutheran. It means nothing to them. They would not know anything about a relationship with Jesus Christ. So there is a rich harvest to be uh, taken there. You can see some of the traditional dresses that the people have. Um, I'm told that a German could look at these dresses of the, the ladies or the hats and tell you what town or region of the country they're from. I've not become enculturated enough to do that, but they, they are very interesting to see the differences in these... these uh, Is that an actual word? What's that? Enculturated. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I read a little bit too much. So, um, <laughs> I wanted to share with you, because this is, this is important to us, this is our life verse that we've chosen. Him, and that's Christ, we proclaim. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present
represent everyone mature in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which he powerfully works within us. You see, it's all about Christ. Dana and Debbie are just the tools that God is using to make Christ known among the peoples of Europe. We proclaim Christ. We don't do it through our own power, because that would be foolish. We do it through the power of Christ in us. I would encourage you at some point to read the first chapter of Colossians. Because Paul lays out for us this wonderful picture of the God who made our salvation possible. And it's amazing. He is an all-powerful God, and that's who we proclaim. The ministry that God has given us is discipling other people. We, As Paul said, we want to see everyone mature in Christ so that they are then able to make other people mature in Christ. And here are just a couple of pictures of people that God has given us the opportunity to, to disciple in their faith. In the middle, we have Maimuna. And Debbie will talk about her and the ministry that we've been able to have with her, and now the ministry that she has uh, a little bit later. But each of these pictures represents an individual or a couple that we've been able to disciple in their own faith. And now they are continuing that ministry of discipleship with others in their local community. Well, maybe you've heard about the flood of refugees that is coming to Europe. Have you heard how many refugees Germany expects to uh, take in this year alone? Yeah, um, I didn't hear what you said, sir. A little higher than that? Not quite a million? Uh, although it may turn out to be a million. Their projections right now are 800,000 in 2015. Last year, we know that Germany took in almost half a million refugees. And for the next three or four years, the government projects that they're going to take in another half million refugees each year. These people are coming from the 1040 window. And so literally, the 1040 window, that, that area where there is the most resistance to the gospel, the people from that area are coming excuse me, right into the heartland of Europe. And we have the opportunity now to speak with them. Um, this picture always almost makes me, me sick um, because this boat is overcrowded with refugees. No European would ever travel like that. The immigration is so high that some countries have commanded their Navy captains to sink vessels like this, to send them right to the bottom of the ocean. And the Navy commanders have had to come back and say, I cannot in good conscience do that. So there's a real struggle. How do we deal with these immigrants? And somebody in a politician's role said, just sink the boat with the people on it. Um, obviously, that's not a good solution. Um, but it opens the doors for us to have ministry um, um, as these refugees come flooding into uh, Europe. So go, go ahead and advance one more. Um, yeah, the number of refugees has quadrupled uh, this year from what it was last year. Okay. Where are the refugees coming from? Uh, we, we give you a couple of the countries. Syria, you know, and they're fleeing the war. From Iraq, they're fleeing crisis. In our area, there is soon to be a, a refugee center set up that is just for women who have been tortured by ISIS. They're looking at having upwards of 50 family units who are composed of women who have been tortured by this so-called religious sect. Um, Afghanistan, people are fleeing poverty. Eritrea, uh, they're fleeing cruelty of the government. And lastly, we have just North Africa, where they're fleeing the violence and the poverty that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Where is Eritrea? Eritrea is down on the western coast of Africa. Uh, and so those people, they, they are coming up through North Africa. They're, they're fleeing the violence. Uh, but as they travel through North Africa, they experience one violence after another. Um, Europe... Even, and I, we don't mention this, let me just take a quick moment to say, Germany's response is to try to get them into something that is warm and dry. For some of these people, that is a shipping container. 
that's been made into like an office space. These refugees are coming and they're saying, this is much better than what I left. Um, and now we, we would think of that, you know, saying a 40 foot uh, travel container that is, you know, from here to the end of that second table, maybe 10 feet wide and no taller than this, we would say, wow, that's not a very nice living condition. But to these refugees, it's heaven uh, because of what they are fleeing. Um, when they come to Europe, generally they come with the clothes on their back and one other piece of, of a personal belonging. What, what do you suppose that might be? Um, both good guesses. Yes? Religious symbols or something? Another good guess. No, not yet. A Bible? They don't have a Bible? No. No. Let's go ahead to the next one. Maybe we can help you out. What do you see in another picture? Oh, cell phone. phone. Now, uh, I feel a little naked th this morning because I got halfway here and realized that I left my mobile phone in my cargo pants. Uh, so I don't have it this morning. But there is not a single refugee that would be without one of these. Now, it may not be this exact model, but it's, it is something like this. Why do they have this? Keep touching back home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Keep touching with the people back home. But also, a lot of these people are being uh, herded by, you've heard of the term coyotes, bringing people up from Mexico. Same kind of thing is true in Europe. There are coyotes that guide the people to Europe, and this is their connection to those people as well. This may have their copy of the Quran on it, uh, but this is how they connect with their world. You can see pictures here of them. They've, they've just gotten to their, their place in Europe. They've got a blanket, and now they're taking a selfie to, to tell mom back home, we made it! Um, even in jail, they keep this. And, and one of the unique ministries that has popped up is you know, what, what's one of the drawbacks of these things? you got to charge them, yeah. So some of our ministries, that we, some of the ministries we work with are looking at having an outreach to just be, people being able to come and charge their cell phone. Uh, we'll have multiple ways for them to connect, so whether it's an Android or an iPhone or this or that, they'll be able to charge it. And while we're charging, while they're charging their cell phone, we get a chance to share the gospel with them. Now, just before you move on, this picture right here, he's a shepherd. Now, what does a shepherd or a camel herder need to do to, to sustain his flock? Get water. Find food, find water. Yeah, those are the two answers I heard. And that's what these uh, camel herders, shepherds have done traditionally. Because of this, do you know how their pattern has changed? They, they now will take their camels not to just places where they can find water, but to places where they get a cell signal. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and so it's, it's amazing, but the world has changed because of these crazy things. Um, we are told that most refugees will be on a seven-year immigration pattern. And so if they come into the country of Greece as their first point of entry in Europe, that most likely is not the place that they're going to wind up. They're going to want to get further north, for, further west in their journey. But that may take seven years. So a person who comes into contact with them in Greece may not be able to follow them unless they're using this kind of device. One of the great ministries that God has given us is the ability to consider and, and implement methods to use these devices as a tool to connect people with God and to connect them with people who can disciple them. So EDOT's ministry is composed of many different things. Uh, here you have uh, pictures of what we call our C2C Story App, which is a gospel presentation. It starts from creation, the first seed, and it works its way through the death and resurrection of Christ, the second seed. It's a visual story that helps you to share the gospel with somebody you're uh, encountering. Let me take a quick poll here. How many of you have a track in your wallet or your purse? 
Okay, uh, one or two people. How many of you have a mobile phone? A lot more hands. One of the great things about that mobile phone is that by using the C2C Story app, you always have a means to share the gospel with somebody. Okay? Uh, the other app that we've developed is this one here that looks like the, the funny symbol. Um, that is from, built in connection with our Turkish partners because Turks are mostly Muslim. And Muslims don't read their holy scriptures the same way we read the Bible. They read it topically. So they will know a select few passages that talk about Allah. They will know a select few passages that talk about many different topics. And our partner in Turkey wanted us to come up with a way to have those same topics, but to link them to verses from the Bible. And so this is the, the result of that. It's an index of Bible passages that they can either read or listen to uh, as they are starting to understand uh, the gospel message. We also have been involved in building a, a TEFL, teaching English as a foreign language, using the, the Chronicles of Narnia movies that have recently been released. So, <laughs> spark some interest there somewhere. <laughs> we have a summer mission trip for you. <laughs> um, it's all right. Good. Talk to us in a little bit. Um, what we've done is this is the basis for a one or two week seminar on teaching English, and the students will come out. They see a video clip, and then that is linked to learning English. But in every lesson the gospel is presented. Uh, each person on that trip will, will give their testimony, and it's a huge opportunity to share the gospel with many people. We've helped uh, several publishers in North Africa, in countries I can't mention, um, develop EPUBs so that they can be distributed on these devices. Uh, EPUBs are electronic books. Um, we also have been involved in developing online Bible courses, and now we're taking that to the next level, we're saying, okay, how can we develop these learning these courses so that they're available on the mobile devices? We also are involved in training facilitators who would be leading those courses. And finally, we're working with Bible schools to develop their own courses that will be taught online. That's called instructional design. And, okay, yeah, using Wi-Fi as ministry, how do you connect to these devices? How do you interact with these? And by the way, is there an open network here in the church that yes. somebody can connect to? Yes. There is. Oh, very good. You're, you're very advanced. Most of the churches we visit, the answer to that would be no. In, in the immigrant uh, communities that we are working with, most of the time there is not a dedicated Wi-Fi signal. And so what we have done is to develop some local Wi-Fi based devices that we can use to share the gospel. I don't have this in my hand, but basically if you take my thumb and you double it so it's out like this, you have a device that I can share content with anybody who has a, a Wi-Fi enabled device. Now what do I have on that? Well I have a, a micro SD card, about the size of my pinky fingernail, but I have several video clips from the Jesus film. Who's seen the Jesus film? Okay, yeah. Well there's a ministry now called Jesus Film Media, and they've taken the Jesus film and they've broken it into segments that are like two to three minutes long. And so what I can do is share that now with a group who sees my Wi-Fi signal. Um, it's a means to share the gospel with this group. There's another device called a Bible box. Again, the idea is to be able to share the gospel with people who connect using their cell phones. And then another device is called the light stream. Now this one has a couple of different capacities, one of them being to actually create micro SD cards. Again, a quick question. How many of you have an iDevice made by Apple? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. You can't use a micro SD card. How many of you don't have an iDevice, but you have a mobile phone? Okay. You probably have the ability to stick a micro SD card into your phone. 
And this device, the light stream, targets those people. We can download content like the Jesus film onto one of those SD cards and then hand it off to somebody. Now the first thing that that person is going to do in the Muslim community is to watch it, but then download it to his or her device and hand that chip off to somebody else. So what happens is that a single memory chip goes around a whole community, and each person who loads it onto their device is going to start seeing the gospel presentation that we're able to put on there. We're, uh, we also have some local ministries, and at this point I'm going to have Debbie uh, just uh, share some of the ministry we have. Dan's got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Does uh, you have any problem with the authorities? Um, we don't experience that problem in Europe. We work with a lot of partners who are in closed countries, and we do have to be careful about that. The, the, the great thing, though, is with some of these devices, I can take in a stack of blank SD cards. They don't have anything on them. So, yeah, sure, you can take them a look at them all you want. There's nothing there. Um, but then once I get on site, then I can make the SD cards, put, put on the content that I want, and then uh, go through it. We do have to be careful. Yeah. Um, there have been cases where missionaries have been taken out of the country because an individual wasn't being careful. So security is something that we talk about with our partners quite a bit. It's almost like handing out Bibles. <laughs> yes, yes, in many ways it is. Yes, sir. Who works with these people after they accept Christ? One of our, our goals is to always work with a local partnership in these countries. So we won't start working with a country until we have a partner, a local partnership who is able to continue the discipleship process with them. What Greater Europe Mission is trying to do now in Europe is develop that same network within Europe because the immigrants are all over the place. They're traveling from one place to another. And we're trying to develop the network of churches and individuals who will be able to disciple the, the, the immigrants as, as they come to faith. Any others? I, okay, the question that comes to my mind is, do we have them available in, in the U.S.? The same idea. That's A lot of that's yep. not stuff that I've come across. You can go to Jesus Film Media. Jesus Film Media, one word. Um, I think it's .org. And you can download all of the videos. You can download the entire Jesus Film in one long segment. Don't recommend that. Uh, but you can also download it in many segments. There's one that, that has um, eight days with Jesus. There's uh, following Jesus. There are several different ways that they break it down. But if you go to Jesus Film Media, you'll be able to download them. You can download them in high resolution if you want to use a device, a tablet size, or a lower resolution if you want to use a, a smartphone. Uh, but that's a great way to do it. Um, you can even include those on a, a wireless network that you have here at the church. Um, I could easily see FLN at the, at the event they were hosting this weekend, have that kind of stuff available. Um, the air stash unit that I was showing you, for 50 bucks, every one of you could probably have one of those in your pocket. Uh, it's available on Amazon.ee. Sorry. Amazon.com and <laughs> uh, you can get them in Germany, but you can also get them here in the States. You can then buy a, an SD card and load it up with a, whatever content you, you want. So you can you can carry it around in your pocket. Yes, sir. How, how come a lot of the pictures look like a lot of the refugees were like young men in their twenties? Yeah. You that yeah. One? Okay, go ahead. So let me, let me answer your question and kind of jump into some of our local ministry because what's happening is that refugees are often the younger folks. They're the ones who are still healthy enough to be able to travel because the conditions that they travel in to come over are unbelievable. They're either on foot, they're on horrible, horrible ships coming over that are sinking in the water. Um, these folks are going through terrible circumstances and so the older folks just can't do it. They are the ones that are in the refugee camp that are being set up on the borders of some of these countries. And the conditions there are horrible too, but they know that they can't make the trip. So it's the young folks that are coming. The parents are giving up everything they have to gather whatever money they can to pay the smugglers 
to get them across some of the borders. And when they arrive, they literally have nothing. Um, many of the women come pregnant. Um, a lot of them are coming with small, little tiny babies. Some of them are coming out of horrible tragedies where they have been raped and abused and tortured by ISIS. Um, their trauma is unbelievable. Um, their children have been traumatized. So the situations they find themselves in when they come seem amazingly good compared to what they're coming from, even though we would look at it and say, what a horrible condition to live in a tent or a trailer or to have to live in a dormitory kind of situation. The countries in Europe are doing what they can for the refugees, but one of the amazing things that we're seeing is that God is opening the floodgates of the countries that were so closed, where we had to smuggle Bibles in, where we had to smuggle these smart devices in to be able to share the gospel. God is bringing the young people, the future generations, to us in Europe, and now we are free to share the gospel with them. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of, of Germany, came out and said, Germans, we have got to get back to our Christian roots or we will be overrun because there are so many Muslims coming into our country. If we do not reach them for Jesus, we will be a Muslim country. And so the Europeans are waking up. Once was a, an area of, of restoration for the gospel where people were coming to Christ, died out. And Europe has been dead for so long. And now, because of the refugees coming in, Europe is waking up. And we are having tremendous opportunities in Europe. Like, we have never seen a revival that we have never seen amongst the Europeans, but also amongst the peoples of the world that God is bringing in. When they come to our area, we're in the Black Forest. We are receiving hundreds of refugees every single day into our little area of Europe. Okay, overwhelming the population to a certain extent. But we have tremendous opportunity, and what we do as women in the community is we are reaching out to the other women and to the children there. We are also seeing the men in our community reaching out to the men. But oftentimes it's the young men who are coming in that are single, they have no attachments. They're not going to stay around very long, so if you don't have a way to reach them mobily, you're not going to reach them at all. So it's up to these guys with their technology to connect with them while they're trying to power their cell phones and to be able to say, hey, have you ever really read the Bible? Would you like to know who God is? And they are able to share with them, giving them these little tiny SD cards so that they can carry that with them wherever they go and give them links back to ways that they can be connected with disciple makers and facilitators who can help translate and also help them to be able to grow in Christ. I'd like to share with you a story about Maimuna. Maimuna is up here holding on to me. And Maimuna has an interesting story. She's from the country of Chad. And um, while she was in Chad, her father died. And her mother was part of a nomadic tribe. And so after her father died, they ended up going to the big city. And while they were in the big city, the children had to beg on the street to be able to get food to eat. And so Maimuna was the youngest in her family. And, but she was also kind of the smartest, if you will. She had a real keen sense about her, and she was cute as a button, and she would go out there, and she would beg, and she would get people to give money so that her family could survive. Well, one day a businessman came along, and he gave her some money, and the next day he came along, and he saw her, and he gave her some money again the next day, and the next day, and pretty soon he said, you know what? You're as smart as anything. You should be going to school. I want to pay for you to go to a school. Let me talk to your mother. And so they found her mother, and he said, could I pay for your daughter to go to school? And she said, well, she's our source of income. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you let me pay for her to go to school, I will give a certain amount of money to you every month for you to live on. And so this man began to pay for Maimuna to go to school, and he sent her to a Christian school there in the country. Well, while she was going to that Christian school, she was also being taught by the imam. Because if they didn't continue to give her her religious teaching in the Islamic religion, she would be killed. So she had to continue to go see the imam. So she was being trained in Islam, but also hearing some of Christianity. And she began to become confused and not know what was true. Well, pretty soon her mom got very sick. And her mom said, I don't think I can continue to care for the family anymore. She began to marry off the different daughters. They start marrying them off at eight. And so she was set up to be married. My Muna was set up to be married with another man uh, from a bigger family, a more wealthy family. But she didn't want to go. And she told this businessman who had been paying, and he said, let me see what I can do. And he found a German missionary couple who was over there doing medical missions. They weren't really believers in Jesus. They were from a Catholic background, had never really truly heard the gospel, but wanted to help people in a medical way. And so they were there, and they agreed to adopt Maimuna and to bring her to Germany with them so that she would not have to be married to this Islamic man. 
But when she arrived in Germany, her life was not easy. She was very confused about life, about being able to be a Muslim, but Christian, but Catholic. I'm not sure what I am. And so she just started to rebel, got into the German culture, got involved with the wrong people, ended up pregnant out of wedlock. Her parents disowned her, the adoptive parents, because it was an embarrassment in their community. They didn't want anything to do with her. So she began to live off the streets again. And she was quite good at that. She knew how to beg. She remembered when she was a child. And she started to live a lifestyle on the streets in Frankfurt, Germany. And there she gathered a lot of money, but also a lot of guys and a lot of drugs and other things that came into her life. And her life started to be destroyed by these things. Her son was, was born. She took care of him. But then she got involved with another man who became abusive to her and her son. And she had to run. Ended up in a shelter. Things in the shelter were not good, ended up coming back to Condren, where her mom and dad, her adopted German parents, lived. But her relationship with them was not very good either, so they basically provided enough food for her and her son, but asked her basically not to come around again. That's when I met my Muna. I met my Muna on the streets as she was taking her son to the public kindergarten because at least there he could get a meal. And uh, when we started talking with each other and sharing with each other, um, our language was a little difficult, but I noticed she knew a little bit of English, and I knew a little bit of German, and she spoke French, and she spoke Arabic, and we tried to communicate the best we could. But my son David became really good friends with my Muna in kindergarten, and they began to play together. And at one point, um, Noah is his name, he decided that he wanted to have a birthday party. And his mom didn't have a place to do it, but she found a place where they could have a party, and she invited a few little friends from the kindergarten. David was one of them. And David said, you know what, Mom? Noah doesn't know Jesus. I want to give him a Bible. And so we found the Jesus Storybook Bible in German, wrapped it up, and that's what David gave Noah as his gift. Well, of course, Noah couldn't read yet. He certainly couldn't read the German yet. His first language was French. And so um, his mother, Maimuna, started to read this children's Bible to him every night before he went to bed. Well, while she was reading, God revealed himself to her in a way that she had never seen. From creation all the way to the cross, she began to see the love God had for her and the love that Jesus had for her and her son. Noah trusted Jesus pretty quickly because he started to see Christ in everything that he saw in the scriptures. And then he decided to put his faith in Jesus. And he told David about it at kindergarten. Well, a couple days later, my Muna came up to me and said, You know what? That Bible you gave my son, it's changing our lives. Do you think you could meet with me to tell me more about Jesus? Because I really want him to be my savior. We began to meet, and I was able and had the privilege of being able to disciple my Muna. Now, I never mentioned her sinful lifestyle. I never mentioned the fact that she was still sleeping with a boyfriend she shouldn't be sleeping with. I never mentioned the drugs that she needed to give up. I just told her about Jesus' love. I read the scriptures with her. We prayed through the scriptures together. Little by little, my Muna said, you know what? I don't think I should be with this guy anymore. That's wrong. We should save sex for marriage. This is a bad thing. I'm getting rid of this. And she did it on her own with God's help. And then she said, drugs are no good. This is bad for my body and my son. I don't need these anymore. And she began to give those up. And little by little, her life changed a dramatic transition from what anybody was expecting from her. Her parents couldn't believe what they were seeing. The people around her couldn't believe what they were seeing. But God was changing her from the inside. And then it was a showing on the outside of her life. Well, my Muna has continued to grow in the Lord. And you know how we talked about those refugees coming into Europe? God prepares people for such a time as this. We call them the person of peace. That person that you find, that you pour your life into. And then they're the ones that God has strategically set up for that moment in history when he is going to reach the masses. She knows four languages fluently. She speaks Arabic, French, German, and English. And she is in the perfect position now to reach the flood of refugees that are coming into Germany. She has a heart and a passion for reaching the lost who have been living on the streets. She has a heart and a passion for reaching those who have been confused by Islam. She has a heart and a compassion for those who are mothers that are single without fathers to raise their children. And God has placed her in Condor for such a time as this. This is the exciting thing about ministry. God sets things up in the perfect way to be able to use other people to reach people for Christ. And so we want to thank you for praying for my Luna because... Through her, I can see the masses being reached. And I am so excited that God gave us the opportunity to pour our lives into her. And now we're, we, we are not there right now, but through her, refugees are being reached for Christ.
And so we talked about our refugee outreach, teaching Awana. You guys have Awana programs. I don't know, Pastor Bill, what time we need to stop here, but... Um, about 10.40. Okay. About 10.40? Yes. You okay. About 10 wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyhow, we have been doing an on Awana outreach, um, just like the Awana program that you guys have here. We have Awana in Germany. We do it in German and in English, and the Germans love to come because they love to practice their English. Um, but they also love to come because they don't get games like that so often, and they don't get that a kind of excitement uh, for the Word of God. And so we have many German young people coming out. Um, one of the girls that was in my TNT group this year, she came out one night, and she was as sick as anything, and she, she just looked terrible. And I said, why did you come? I don't understand. You should be home in bed. She said, well, there's no one at home. And I said, what do you mean there's no one at home? She says, my dad works. My mom works. There's no one there. Why would I want to lay in bed when no one's home? At least here, someone loves me. And that spoke wonders to me, because here are young people who have nowhere to go, who want to come to an Awana program, because there they find the love, not only of Jesus, but people who will reach out and love them. And so pray for our Awana program when you think about it. Pray for our local children's ministry. We go to a bilingual church. Um, I'm the children's director there. We have ministry to lots of young children who are coming in from the basically from the neighborhood, just like you guys do. Through the children, you can reach the families. And so pray for our children's ministry as well. Um, we help with our bilingual school. Our children attend a German bilingual Christian school. That's a mouthful. Um, but basically, um, their lessons are mostly in German, some in English, and so they are bilingual. And um, there, there are many, many German families who send their children because they want them to have English. Um, so we have an opportunity to share the gospel with them there. And even though it's a Christian school, many of the German parents who send their children, those children and those parents don't know Jesus. So we have an opportunity to present the Lord to them. Um, reaching out to our neighbors, much like you, we have neighbors, and um, we have found that gardening is the number one way to reach your neighbors in Germany. They love to garden, and if you are out there in your garden, they will talk to you, and you can talk to them, and they'll tell you what an Unkraut is, and, and we all hate Unkraut because that's the weeds, and, um, and so we all talk about our gardens and our flowers, and this is how we reach out to our neighbors and showing them kindness. I want to challenge you. How many of you have ever said to somebody, oh, I'll pray for you, and then walked away? Have you done that? I want to challenge you. The number one way I have found to start a message of the gospel with someone is when they talk to me about something in their life, and I say, I'll pray for you. I don't just say, I'll pray for you and walk away. I stop right then and there, no matter where we are, and we pray together for that situation or for that event that's going on in their lives. The German people are blown away by how much we, as Americans, they say, pray. Now I say, well, it's not Americans, it's Christians. But, you know, they, they, they look at us and they go, wow, you guys pray an awful lot in all kinds of weird ways, but, you know, we pray. Um, so, praying with people. We go prayer walking in our neighborhood. We stop in front of people's houses and we bow our heads. No, we don't keep our eyes open. We bow our heads. We do it on purpose so they know we're praying. Um, but we, we pray for the neighbors and for the people in our neighborhood. And we've had people come up to us and say, what are you doing? We said, we're praying for you. They said, you are? You know, we said, yeah, we believe that the Lord wants to bless your life. He does. And so we have opportunity to be able to share with people just by prayer walking in our neighborhood and praying for people there. So... Um, our ladies' Bible studies are another way that we're reaching out. Um, we gather together every week for Bible study with the German ladies and the American ladies together. Uh, we use CBSI. I don't know if some of you have heard of CBSI, but that's a wonderful Bible study tool that we use. And we also use um, some of the Beth Moore series. The German women seem to find that humorous. They think that she's a hoot, and that does every American talk like that and wear their hair like that? And you know what I'm talking about, you have to watch a Beth Moore video sometime. But, um, but we have many German women coming out to these as well. So that's just a little bit about our ministries there. Um, I know you may have some questions, but again, we want to ask you to just keep praying for us. Um, we appreciate your partnership with us financially as a church. We are struggling a little bit because of our tax situation there, and the German government decided to also pull Kindergeld, which was the money they gave us for our kids' schooling. So they have pulled that as well. So we are in need of raising up a little bit more financially, so needing additional financial supporters. Um, we thank you for those who have given special gifts to help us get over the hurdle with the tax burden. For those of you who don't know, missionaries were told we didn't need to pay tax in Germany. 
The German government decided they needed more money to help with all the refugees coming in and various other expenses like bailing Greece out from their, their problems. And so they decided that missionaries do owe taxes. And so they came back to all the missionaries and said, guess what, not only do you have to pay tax, but you have to pay back taxes for seven years. And additionally, you have to pay the interest on those taxes that we would have gotten from the money had you paid it. So even though it was our fault and we told you you didn't have to pay, guess what, you do. So, um, by the way, you have 30 days to pay it or you go to jail. So, um, so we kind of had to scramble and our mission gave us a loan to be able to pay those taxes, but now we are paying them back to the mission because obviously bailing out that number of missionaries all across Europe, not just in Germany, but this has happened in several other countries as well. So um, thank you so much for those of you who have been contributing and supporting us and encouraging us through your special gifts. I know we've been speed talking for about <laughs> 30 minutes. Um, any questions that you might have? Yes, sir. Who pays for all of this and what kind of equipment and stuff that you use to minister there? Um, most of the time I get reimbursed for these things. Um, I have on occasion taken money that's come in for a, a birthday to, to buy a project, to buy something that... Because part of what we want to do is to test it before we offer it as a solution. Um, most of the time, the ministry is paying for that. Um, so, But there are times when I'll see something that I think might be useful, and so I'll go ahead and buy it. Uh, and then test it out. And then I do report it to our group. Uh, and then we also report with our other partners what we're finding useful, what we're not finding useful, so that they can make intelligent choices uh, on how to use things. Um, for those of you who have non-iPhones, yeah, that's all right. We have enough time. I can pull up the, the... Okay, well, I just want to mention one of the other things that, that is a possible way to do ministry now is um, these phones, if you have another one close by, you can actually just get them relatively close. Some people even tap them together and share content that way. Um, so we're, we're looking to see what are the, the best ways to connect people um, using the technology. How do they connect to you? There must yeah. be an expense. Um, Africa in particular is way ahead of us in terms of the banking industry. And this device is not just a communication tool, but it is also their bank. So they can actually transfer money through this device. I don't understand how it all works, but they, they do have credit that comes to them as in, in the form of payment. And so they do have plans. Um, they are pennies versus what we pay. Several companies in the world are actually getting together to promote wireless devices. I know Google is involved, Amazon is involved, I think Microsoft is involved too. The basic idea is, let's get everybody in Africa a simple, cheap device. Because once we get it into their hands, we have them for life. You know, how many of you didn't have one of these five or ten years ago? Yeah, okay. How many of you at that point in time thought, I don't need one of these things, they're just another thing to keep track of, yeah. Exactly. Now, how many of you are going, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Yeah. Um, I, I'm missing mine right now. It's, it's at the Shorts house, and I know right where it is, but it's not with me, and that's a little nerve-wracking. Um, these, these devices have become a part of our lives. Most people would tell you now, this is not a piece of technology. This is an extension of me. Um, I get my news on this. I connect with my friends on this. I, I might even make phone calls with it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I get the weather. I get the traffic updates. I, whatever I do, this is involved. It's, it's not a piece of technology. It's part of it. I can't live without it. Um, if you want to really mess with your children and grandchildren, hide this on them. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to give that away for you. Um, what other... Questions do you have? 